Great. So thank you, uh, Cameron, for the invitation to be here. Um, I want to talk briefly. I've made you know, the great uh, mistake that you did not make. I have 10 slides, and I have 10 minutes. So what I'll try to do is I'd like to rush through, and uh, not too quickly, the first uh, seven, because what I'd like to get to is the heart of the matter as regards uh, access in the uh, priority review voucher. We wrote this paper back in 2006. We started the work back in 2002, which had to do with the problem that we all are, are familiar with, which there are too few drugs to treat uh, tropical diseases, hence the name neglected tropical diseases. I would just add that the, the paper that we wrote that then ultimately led to the creation of Priority Review Voucher, which was Section 524 of the 2007 FDA Amendments Act, included an access requirement. So we anticipated that we thought this would be required. Um, in the wisdom of the U.S. Congress, when it was actually enacted, there was not an access provision, and I'll, I'll say more about that as I go through, but we tried to address it in the, in the initial paper. So for those of you who may not be familiar with this, the notion is this. This is what's called a pull incentive. Rather than encouraging or investing money to say, let's hope that somebody, something comes out at the other end, this is a pull incentive that rewards if a uh, sponsor has um, a new treatment uh, for, and there's a list, the list can be amended, I'll show it to you in a moment, the reward that they get for coming up with a new treatment for a neglected tropical disease is a priority review voucher. Well, what's that? It means that rather than standard review, that you're going to get a priority review at the FDA. There, at the time we wrote the paper, there were three mechanisms for expedited review. There was priority review, fast track, and accelerated approval. There's now a fourth one, which is called breakthrough. The reason that we chose priority review is because we believed it was the one that did not obviate or did not reduce the safety requirement, and that would be important. Now, here on the right side of the slide, you can see there are two things you can do with it. You can take the voucher and cash it in, so that means there's a second drug. There's something that I want to introduce into the U.S. market. I want uh, U.S. patients to be able to have access to it. And rather than standard review, I'd like to get this expedited review. And the time value of money tells you that it has value, which we estimated at about $322 million based on that, the time value of money. The other thing you can do with it is you can sell it. And I'll say more about selling these. The prices have varied. Many of them have been sold over time, and they have varied from a roughly three, a peak of 350 million. There were two vouchers that were sold last year, about 125, 110. So, and, and I'll say more about why that price varies. So this is the list right now of eligible uh, diseases, and you'll see that some of them don't uh, fit. Uh, so I wouldn't argue we've got Zika as a very, very small population. We also now see that medical countermeasures has been added. Um, I, I can, if, if time allows, I'll say more about that. I wish that were not in there. And to be perfectly frank, we wish that uh, pediatric rare diseases were not also voucher eligible. The reason being that the notion of this was we wanted to reward a drug sponsor, a manufacturer that came up with a new medicine for a tropical disease. As time unfolded, it played a role for rare pediatric disorders to be awarded, but uh, I can argue that, that I think that day is over. Uh, so here's the history. Uh, the first voucher was won by Novartis for the drug Quartum, uh, then Certuro, Impavido, and of course we see here in, the, in, in recent time uh, Benznitazole last year. Uh, and then, of course, Moxidectin, which won its award last week. And I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the final two because the mechanisms that have been included there for access, trying to address the access issue, I think are unique and are um, a best practice that, that we hope will be emulated by others. You can also see in the red bars that there have been more vouchers. There have been roughly 20, not roughly, there have been exactly 20 that have been awarded, but more of them for rare pediatric disorders. Um, this has limited, uh, what's happened is the Congress says this will sunset in roughly three years hence, and every time it's been reauthorized, and I think it'll be reauthorized again. As I said earlier, I wish that weren't so, because the value of the voucher is directly proportional or inversely proportional, proportional to the number of them. So as we have more vouchers, the value goes down. Um, 
we know that they're having some, some benefit, and this second quote I think is particularly noteworthy because Mark Sullivan is, is at Medicines Development for Global Health, which uh, was part of the consortium that uh, contributed to moxidectin, and I think it's particularly noteworthy, um, and it's interesting that our previous speaker was from Merck. Merck, for many years, has done a lovely job of contributing ivermectin for uh, onchocerasiasis, but I know, but for many years did. Here's the thing, uh, when, when you have contribution like that, it can make uh, the market even less desirable. If we think that neglected tropical diseases have a problem of a market failure, that can be exacerbated by um, a donation program. So we think it's particularly noteworthy that moxidectin um, has been awarded this way, and we think it's, uh, it's certainly um, um, worthy of this. Um, so... There have been been concerns expressed. We sh we share those concerns. Uh, Cameron and I wrote a piece in um, um, in Financial Times that we're grateful that they uh, they uh, printed, which was a an opinion piece about the problem in the uh, priority review program. And the pro the the problem is twofold. One, there's a a novelty issue, and we won't address it today, but has to do with how do we define what's a novel agent, and the second is. Shouldn't the FDA require an access program? Is it gaming the program if someone wins a voucher as a result of them coming up with this new medicine, but then patients can't get it? Shouldn't there be a requirement? This is the, the heart of the access issue. And uh, Medicine Sans Frontières and some others have raised this issue. This is their uh, notion, their, their language about it, and said, we believe that there should be changes in the program to require that and, and um, and that that should come through a regulatory mechanism. Um, so here are some ways to think about that. On the, on the left-hand side here, you can argue that there could be a couple of options, that if an access plan were required, and if that became a new requirement for the voucher program, that it should be required by FDA, and that there's somebody other than the FDA, which uh, I would argue it has, does not have that expertise, but there certainly are other arms of federal agencies in the United States and certainly other uh, agencies outside of the United States that I think could, in fact, evaluate an access program. Now, they'll all be unique, and I've been talking a lot <laughs> about this, that every disease state uh, has differences. The state of the science, the state of the, the uh, health systems where... Uh, the disease is endemic where there are patients. All those factors are relevant, and they're certainly relevant in the remarks that you were making. So one could argue that there ought to be, or, or one, one proposal is, that if you're going to make an access requirement, that it ought to be required by the FDA, and that if the FDA doesn't have the expertise, that they would outsource it to somebody else who would evaluate an access program, and then annually that could be evaluated and updated. Another option that's been talked about is, yes, make the FDA require an access plan, but the FDA doesn't have the expertise, and in fact, it would be difficult to say, here's the template, everyone should answer these issues. Just simply have them post it and then let the forces of public scrutiny and public comment um, win the day. Let people make their own assessments. Uh, we believe that could work. Uh, one objection has been that it's possible that people could um, confuse this and say, oh, because the FDA has posted it or it came as a part of the award for a voucher, does that mean that the FDA has endorsed it? And the notion is, no, they wouldn't. They would just simply print it. They would simply pu uh, bring it on and say, yes, it was provided. Now here it is for public scrutiny. On the voluntary side, there have been a couple of different approaches to this. One is you could argue that before we got to benzenidazole for Chagas, that all of the plans were voluntary plans provided by the manufacturers, and, and I certainly know, and, and I know that other speakers will address this, that each of those companies have varied in terms of their commitment to, to uh, making their drug accessible. And over time, certainly I think Novartis has done a lot and has a specific access program related to quartum, and a lot has been done. One could argue that some of the other companies who are listed here who are sponsors those programs have done less or have done different things. Part of that driven by the unique state of their, um, the disease, the drug, where patients are, and so on. Benzenidazole, uh, we found particularly noteworthy, and that's the reason that we wrote the opinion piece, 
Because what's interesting about it is it's, it's a consortium. So this wasn't just a pharma company in Sud, which is in uh, Argentina, but it also had Mundo Sano, which is a, a foundation uh, for patients with Chagas, and then also included uh, Dindi. And the, the nice thing about that is that as over time, product development groups have evolved and matured. And when you enter into an agreement with them to share data, we're going to work together on this sponsorship, that automatically says we're going to start coming to some agreements about what do we mean by access. Um, if there's IP, intellectual property, that's created as a result of this, who owns it? Who's going to get the benefit? And in this particular case, they specifically said if at a future date we sell the voucher, and we know the vouchers have value, that at least half of that is going to go toward access. The sponsors agreed to that beforehand, and we thought that tying the value specifically to access to the voucher was a very innovative approach, and, and we commented about that. I would argue that the new, the uh, latest one, so moxidectin, also has some very innovative approaches, which is uh, Mark Sullivan has specifically said in an interview that he did last week that their plan is to look at other disease states that are also on that tropical list of neglected tropical diseases and to take some of the proceeds to do the clinical work so that they can demonstrate if it's got efficacy and safety in these other areas and that that will be part of the funding mechanism. So I think it's very interesting that they have al already foreseen this and they already have this notion. They've put a price that I think they argue is, is an accessible price and that there are also some elements of an access plan that they've d uh, developed. We would argue, and this is the, the, what we've said, I would argue that option two is, is really um, closely resembles what Medicine Sans Frontier has been uh, advocating for and that option four, as I've just described it, is what uh, Cameron and I wrote about in the uh, Financial Times article. We believe that that probably is the best way to, to handle access. One, because I would argue it's out of the jurisdictional authority and expertise of FDA to require it. And two, because of the uniqueness of each of the disease states, we believe that uh, each one of those plans will be different and could be shaped to fit that disease state. And um, <clears throat> we, we've uh, euphemistically used this term. I think public shaming uh, is, a, is a powerful force and that if people are doing a lousy job or, or showing a very poor plan, that the power of public scrutiny, uh, I don't, not every company is responsive to that, but one could certainly argue, and we're going to hear more about the Access to Medicines Foundation approach, that it rests on that same assumption, that public scrutiny is a powerful force, and we would argue that's a way to improve that. Um, we are starting an initiative, I hope uh, later in the day, or, or I hear we're going out for drinks tonight, perhaps we can talk more about this, but uh, our Global Health Institute, the Fuqua School of Business, our public policy, and also Duke Law are taking on an initiative to start looking at each of the um, winners of the voucher to evaluate those very similar in approach as the Access to Medicines Foundation that you're going to hear more about and to talk about and do an annual report to say, well, what are they doing about access and how much progress have they made since the previous year and use this as a mechanism to evaluate their plans rather than to um, advocate for a regulatory change, which, again, I don't think is within the jurisdiction of the, of the Food and Drug Administration. So with that, I'll say thank you.